hello everyone. Um, I am Jaideep Gupte. I am a fellow of the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, but really I'm a Varsova native. Um, and today uh, I want to talk to you about the story of a neighborhood. Uh, because in many ways, this story is my story, uh, but it is also your story. And it is our story in Varsova. And incredibly, it's a story that describes the biggest changes that are going on in our world today. Do Bhiga Zameen, or Two Parcels of Land, was an epic Bollywood movie in the 1950s. I think we'll all remember. It was directed by the eternally talented and iconic Bimal Roy. Uh, he was inspired by new realist Italian cinema. And it was the first film uh, I think it was the first Indian film to win at the Khans. Uh, it's a film about Shambhu the farmer, uh, his wife Parvati, his son Kanahiya, who are caught in a struggle to save their only source of livelihood, their farmland, from being developed into mills. Of course, we all remember the iconic pathos in the closing scene when Shambhu is denied even one fistful of his own land as he loses ownership over it. Now, why do I bring this up in a TEDx Varsova talk? Because those iconic scenes of farmland were filmed, in fact, right in Varsova, where today there stands a metro rail, a cafe coffee day in between the old seven bungalows. There once were the fields that Shambhu toiled upon. And those fields were not far from the fishing village of Varsova, which, of course, today continues as an urban village and is one of the best places to buy fish. Now, I bring this up to illustrate that cities that we live in today were not even figments of our imagination a generation ago. They are what they are because of what we have made them. We individually thrive or survive or even fail in them because of decisions that were made about the built environment over long periods of time. So they, the built environment um, is a consequence of the decisions that have been made about it over long periods of time. And what are these decisions? What are these choices that I speak of? Well, I'm speaking of all the technical choices, of course, of how cities are designed, how they are planned and how they're built. Where do people live? Where do they work? How will they get from where they live to where they work and back? How tall are the buildings? What are the buildings made of? But I'm also speaking about all the cultural, social, and economic choices of how we live, play, work, and interact within this built up space. Are parks and beaches for all children or only for some children? Are the footpaths for everyone or only for those who are physically able to jump over the obstacles? I'm also speaking of the political choices about what we do when there is too much of one thing and not enough of another. Think now of the pandemic. Are we safe if our neighbor is not safe? How are essential services such as water and sanitation, public transport uh, or electricity distributed? How do we allocate scarce resources to ensure everyone is safe and no one is left behind? And this political choices. These political choices are important because it's not simply about elections. It is also about these everyday choices we make or we are able to make and the choices that are forced upon us as urban residents. Now the story of urban neighborhoods and cities goes something like this. Like people live, work, play in close proximity so that they can interact in more diverse ways. And in turn, this produces more opportunities to live, work, and play. Now, in technical terms, this is known as economies of agglomeration. The success of this story caused something dramatic to happen on May 23rd, 2007. On that day, humanity became more urban than rural. And ever since the global population, the global urban population has grown and scientists predict that by 2050, nearly 70% of people will live in cities and towns. And almost all of this urban growth expected to occur between today and 2050 is going to happen in India, in China and across Africa. 
In India alone, we will add nearly half a billion people to our towns and cities. But this story is not one of opportunity alone. Urban living brings with it serious challenges. 70% of CO2 emissions are linked to urban areas. The number of urban residents exposed to multiple hazards such as flooding, uh, landslides, earthquakes, fires, both large and small, is set to increase from 2 billion to 4 billion. Now, on top of this, we also see crime and violence urbanizing in very particular ways. India consistently shows up in the list of top 10 most dangerous places for women, and urban crime rates are worsening. Now, as much as we try and hide behind all the glitz and glamour, Mumbai is one of the most unsafe cities for senior citizens. Mumbai and Delhi are the most unsafe for children, while kidnapping is a serious and growing concern across all our cities. But this is not the only type of violence uh, city residents face. Think of traffic accidents. Those too are a serious physical threat, and particularly so to pedestrians, those who do not have cars or choose to walk or ride a bike, or those who must work on the streets. Being forcibly evicted from your home too is a form of violence and it is a growing risk to huge numbers of people in Mumbai. Not having access to toilets or clean drinking water too is a form of what is known as infrastructural violence. Now in this context, what if I were to tell you that there is one innovation that provides jobs to well over half of all workers globally? 90% in developing countries, 67% in emerging economies. In India alone, nearly half of the urban workforce is employed by it. Not only that, this innovation provides housing and shelter to nearly a billion people. Millions use it to access healthcare, to access water, electricity. But would you believe me if I told you that instead of nurturing this innovation, making it safe, all our cities tend to persecute it. We police it. We try and eradicate it. I, of course, am speaking of the informal economy, or system D, as the French philosophers termed it, the make-do economy, or in India, we call it the Jugaad economy. A way of urban life that is characterized by slums and shacks, for sure, but also by street vendors, vibrant markets, access to services where state or formal services are non-existent, a way of life that our cities now depend on. Now consider that everything that we know about violence prevention and creating safe cities points out that opportunities matter. The more people feel like they have something positive to aspire to, that they have something positive to contribute to society, that they belong somewhere that is nurturing and understanding of their views, the more likely it is that they will invest in looking after the places that produce such opportunities. Now to explain what I mean, think of how we live. If I ask you to think about a good home, it is unlikely that you will first think of your legal tenure arrangements or your ownership documents, and nor should you, because housing is not simply about accommodation. It is also about how we are hospitable how we connect with our friends and neighbors, how we understand homes as more than bricks and mortar and square footage. And when we do this, we can start to see that calling a place informal or slum or illegal is actually deeply unproductive. If you want to create cities that are safe for everyone, it matters how we live together in a place we can all contribute to. And this is why neighborhoods are such an important variable because they can enable a way of urban life that is inclusive. And this is where the story of Varsova becomes so relevant. Right? What was a patch of farmland is now a vibrant, bustling urban neighborhood. But remember, this does not happen overnight. It happened because of choices that were made over many years. Right? Shambhu lost his Dobhi Gazameen, but it falls on us now to ensure that our neighborhoods are inclusive and safe for everyone. Now, this means investing our hard-earned money, our precious time, 
not just inside the four walls of our own homes, but also in public spaces. That gutter that is overflowing, what can you do about it? That street corner that is dark or unsafe for women or children, what can you do about it? Also think of those places that are called slums or illegal and those types of livelihoods that the informal economy provides. Does it help to persecute these people, these places, these jobs, when so many of us depend on these systems? What we find is that slum dwellers are unlikely to invest in their homes if they fear evictions. But with legal titles, residents can raise funds or use their own money to make incremental improvements. Removing slums actually creates more problems than it solves and does not fix the underlying issue that brought individuals to the slums in the first place. A slum is often the only affordable housing option in a city, even if the shelter is frequently inadequate and the conditions are poor. Indeed, investing in slums rather than demolishing them benefits cities by supporting the integration of slum dwellers into the urban economy as consumers, as employees, but also as entrepreneurs, as innovators, and most importantly, as citizens. You know, if our towns and cities are to be safe places to live, work, and play, they also need to embrace informality as an innovation of our generation. Now, this certainly does not mean anything goes, chalta hai, let's do nothing, let the city just happen. Quite the opposite. Right? We have to rapidly learn from the examples where good community collaboration have led to urban upgrading and violence reduction without the need to demolish or evict or make some people illegal. Right? Remember Shambhu, he lost his do bhiga zameen. But that fistful of land is now ours. We need to ensure that our neighborhoods are welcoming of the weakest, the poorest, the most marginalized urban residents, because if we leave them behind, the city will be left weaker. Thank you.